Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Hallelujah. Um, and, on the, uh, and, and now when we discover Cyprus, that's one of the islands. Okay, uh, we're getting there. Okay, Cyprus, are, they're passing by. And hallelujah. Here we go. They're going to Coes, Rhodes. Padua, you see these, you see these, uh, the roads is an island, and then Padua. Now, they're going to pass by Cyprus, this big island right out here in the middle of the Great Sea, uh, on their way. And they had discovered, now when we had discovered Cyprus was on the left hand, in other words, they saw that they were passing to the, the, red, the orange or burgundy one to be fine. Okay. Thank you, sweetie. All right. It says, now when they saw that Cyprus was on the left hand, so they're sailing this, this way, they saw the Cypress State Island that was on their left hand. Hallelujah. Um, and sailed into Syria. Now, Syria is this area here. Okay. And um, I guess if I had mine, then I could look at it a little bit better. But Paul's writing order. Nope, 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 nope. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, guys. I came home. I was we were here all day until about 5 o'clock working, and uh, Paul's writing orders, the Apostle Paul, that's what I'm looking for is Apostle Paul in my, my notes here. Anyway, we'll just go here. All right, so he, he said when he saw that, he was going to go into Syria. This region right down here is Syria, okay, and um, <clears throat> it says um, that when he saw Cyprus on the left hand, they sailed in the Syria and landed at Tyre. And for there, the ship was to unladen her burden, unlaid her burden. In other words, they were, they, remember, they're catching ships, okay? They're just traveling, they're not, they're not, these are not charter boats. They're grabbing a boat that they go on. So they have sailed all down through, passed by there, and landed at Tyre. Well, that's where the ship was supposed to unload. And, um, and finding certain disciples, we tarried there seven days. So they stayed seven days there in Tyre. We departed, went our way, and then uh, they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And we had taken our leave one of another. We took, ship, we took a ship and returned home again. And there we were, when, and when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to um, Patelimus, which is right there, just below those tires, down there, just a short drip. And the next day, they were of Paul's company, departed and came into Caesarea, uh, where we, we're going to find Caesarea's next town over. Hallelujah. And I keep losing my place when I look back and forth here, so I'm sorry. And we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which had seven, which it was, was one of the seven and abode with him. Remember the seven elder uh, deacons that were chosen out? And the same man had four vir daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Jude Judea. So it came down from... Where's Judea at on here? Oh, somewhere up in here. Think came down here to where they were in Caesarea. Uh, came down from Judea. A certain prophet named Agabus. And he, when he's coming out, he took Paul's girdle, bound his own hand, bound his own hands and feet, and said, "Thus saith the Holy Ghost: So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hand of the Gentiles." And when we heard these things, both we and they of the place besought him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered and said, "What mean ye to break, weep and break mine heart? For I am not ready to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus." And when he would not be persuaded, we see saying, "The Lord." the will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we took our, our carriages and went down to Jerusalem. All righty. And there went with us a certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Manasin, Manasin of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. And the day following, Paul went in with uh, us unto the James and unto all the elders that were present. And when we had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. Now remember, Paul's been traveling for a number of years throughout all of this, all of this other region uh, and, and ministering all these places. Antioch, all up, he's been all up in here, all over this part of the, the world. He's been, spent three trips here. This is his third trip he's returned from. He spends all this time, these years, six, seven years of ministry in this area. 
And so he comes to Jerusalem to meet with James to give him an account or to, to kind of let them just catch up on what he's been doing. And um, when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews that are which, uh, that are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And, thou are informed, uh, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children, neither walk after their customs. What is it therefore the multitude must need come together, for they will hear that thou art come. In other words, now there have been reports coming back and forth that Paul's been out preaching, you know, we do, you know, do it with Moses, don't circumcise, don't keep any of the customs. And, and in reality, he was in the sense that he's saying you can't be saved by those things. Okay? You can't be saved by any of the things of the law. You can't, they, they don't work. That's not going to save you. And um, do therefore uh, this that we say to thee, we have four men which have the vow on them. Take them and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all know that, thou, that those things whereof thou, that we were informed concerning thee are nothing, but thou, that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing except only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from strangling, and from fornication. And then Paul took the men and the next day purified himself with them to enter into the temple to signify the accomplishments of the days of the purification and to an offering that should be offered for every one of them. Now I'm going to say this. Paul was doing this so he could get an altar. It wasn't because he believed he had to purify himself and take an altar. But you know they asked him to do it and, and he, they would have never listened to a word he had to say if he walked in without purifying himself according to the law. Okay? It wasn't he thought he had to keep it but because he knew they would not receive him if he didn't, he did it. Okay? We, how do you do that? From his writings. Yeah. Yeah. I know from his writings that, that he had to do that. Okay? Okay. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were in Asia, of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people again, and the law in this place, and further brought Greeks into, uh, also into the temple, and it polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city of Trophimus an Ephesian whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the city and forth the doors were shut. And as they went out to kill him, about to kill I am telling you, it is amazing how people respond when you mess with their doctrine. When you don't do it their way. When you, they want to kill you. You think, well, if I was, doing, if, if I was, I was just walking over and doing everything right, people would just love me. No, they tried to kill Paul all the time. Yeah. And they got pastors. They may not try to kill pastors, but sometimes they, they, they uh, verbally or, or socially or mentally or whatever try to destroy them. You know? I mean, you know, you, they just don't do it the way they want it done, and boy, they'll, they'll assassinate you. Character-wise or verbally or whatever, or however they can do it. You know, that's a spirit. It's the spirit that doesn't want the truth that will resist the truth and stir people up to be lying accusations. If you look in the Bible, how many times, I mean, I mean, with Jesus, they, they paid people to come lie about Jesus at his trial. They, they worked to get Jesus killed by lying. Here, they come in and just start telling lies about Paul, but they are supposed he brought an Ephesian in. He, apparently, he didn't bring the Ephesian in. In other places, there was one place that we read to last week where 40 men, made a, no, 40 men made a vow they would not eat or drink until Paul was dead. One place they stoned him and left him for dead. One place they caught, they caught a conspiracy, they let him down out the window, you know. I am telling you, over and over and over again, they tried to kill Paul. And all Paul was doing was bringing truth. I said all what Paul was doing was bringing truth. Amen. And well, he didn't do it in love. Well, he said he's the one who wrote in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. Amen. He wrote the great love chapter to the church at Corneth. Hello. Paul knew something about walking in love. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? However, however, that devil will get stirred up when you bring truth. And bring attacks and bring lies and say things and stir up trouble. Uh, and let me tell you something. Saying something without saying something is just as bad as saying it. Amen. Did you get lost there, Karen? Innuendos. Yeah. 
I remember um, a number of years ago here in our church, we had somebody in our church, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to here. We had somebody in our church, and they, they, um, they didn't leave in a, in, a, in a positive manner with us. They left with a church split, actually. And, the, and then, of course, later on, they found out the guy that did all the church split was messed up, you know. And, and this person um, knew, now, now, now knows one of the ministers that I oversee now. They were in school together. And when they came back to this area, uh, they said, well, we, you know, some, the, that guy said something about me. And, and he went, this guy that used to be in our church looked at me and went, oh, him. And the guy went, what? No, I'm, I'm not saying anything. He didn't have to say anything. His innuendo left that something was wrong. It was deliberate and purposeful. We see when you walk in the truth and you walk in the light, constantly doing what the Word of God says, you're going to have people come after you. Paul had it going on all the time. People were trying to kill Paul on a regular basis. Amen? I'm telling you, he, he gets up in the morning and somebody's out, that, is out planning to assassinate him. There's a scheme somewhere. And what did he do? Preach the truth. All he did was preach the truth. And all they wanted to do was kill him. Hello. And so they were out to, to kill him. Tidings came into the chief captain of the band that all of Jerusalem was in an uproar who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down under them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Now see, you know, these guys knew they were in trouble with the Romans. See, the thing about Rome was they would let you do your own thing unless you got out of hand and then, you, then, then the, the uh, weight of Rome came against you. Now, if you just kept the peace and you didn't do whatever, they just let you go on about your business. Once, once they conquered you and brought you in, they would let you con continue your culture and continue doing as long as you were paying duty and taxes to Rome and didn't cause any trouble. They just kind of let you. It just, it's, and the guys they sent to rule over those areas were more concerned about getting a, a turmoil, a tumult, or some kind of something going on that got reported back to Rome, which would mean they wouldn't get promoted. Okay? So they had political people back then. But so, you know, they heard something was going on. They sent the soldiers. And as soon as the people that were beating Paul saw the soldiers, they took off. Okay? <clears throat> and the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with the chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing, some another among the multitude. And when he could not know certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried to the castle. And he was about, he, and when he came up the stairs, upon the stairs, so and so, that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. And for the multitude of the people followed after crying away with him. And as Paul was led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, may I speak unto thee, who, uh, who said, the, the chief captain said, canst thou speak Greek? In other words, he said it to him in Greek. I mean, it kind of shocked him. This is a just, he thinks it's just some low-class Jew who comes and speaks to him in his own language. Okay? <clears throat> And he, Art thou not that Egyptian which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murdered? And Paul said, in other words, he, had, he thought this guy was, Paul was somebody else. And but Paul said, I'm a man which is a, am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Sicilia, uh, Sicilia, a citizen of no mean city. And I, in other words, he, he, was a, he was from a region, wasn't really any big city he came from. Okay, and I beseech he suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him a license, Paul stood on the stairs, beckoned him with the hand unto the people. And when he made a great silence, he spake unto, the, spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue. And he went from Greek to Hebrew, saying, Men, brother, fathers, hear my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he saith, I am verily a man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Sicilia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. Boy, I got tongue out. Come out of here. And Brian, my name, Gamaliel. Okay, Gamaliel. Now, he said, I was brought up in this city, brought up in Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, which was a well known teacher, very respected, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of our fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. And also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders from whom I also received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem before to be punished. He was a zealot to get rid of Christians. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was coming to the city of Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone, uh, shone from heaven a great light round about me. Now, he was, he was coming on the noonday sun, I mean, the brightest part of the day, and there was a light brighter than the noonday sun. And I fell onto the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered and said, Who art thou, Lord? 
He said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise, go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of the things which thou art appointed for to do, uh, for thee to do. And when, they, and when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with, with me, I came to Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt with me, came unto me and stood by, and said unto me, Brother Saul. Now see, Jesus appeared to, remember, Jesus appeared to Ananias. They go call for one Saul of Tarsus. Remember that? Okay. And um, he said, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked upon him. And he said, the God of our fathers hath chosen thee. That thou shalt. Now remember, if you go back and read the earlier accounts, they don't have all this details not there. Paul's sharing more detail than that we share back in the earlier part of Acts. Okay? And you know, uh, that's, that's okay. Because, you know, Dad Hagee used to tell stories. You, you go and hear stories. And one time he'd be preaching, he would share part of a story. Another time he'd start sharing that same story, but share a different aspect he, you didn't hear the last time. Sometimes you, and then, and then there was one time he was saying something. He said, I've never shared this story. It was way, way, way out in his ministry. And he shared something in that story that was relevant about in that particular, that particular uh, ser service. But he said, I've never shared this part before. And he shared something. You went, wow. You've heard the story over and over and over again. He said, but I've never shared this part. Well, see, this is what happened with Paul. He, you know, he, he shared parts of it earlier. But now he's come to a place. He's sharing some, part, some parts we didn't, we don't have an account of earlier. Okay. <clears throat> He said, the God of our fathers chosen thee, thou that shouldest know his will, and see the just one, thou shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now, why tarriest thou arise, and she may baptize, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that when I was coming to Jerusalem, and when it came to pass that I was coming to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. <laughs> That's not happened with just a few times. Let me say something. If you think because you are you got the coolest, slickest method to reach people, and that everybody, because you're just going to show up and, and awe them with how cool and, and slick and just like them you are and still serve God, and you're going to win everybody, you're just dead, dead wrong. We are to preach the truth. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to convince them and convict them of what that is said, to bring them. And if they reject that, and there are going to be people who reject that. Yeah. And everybody thinks they got the, this new whatever that's going to be the thing that gets everybody to get saved. The thing you're supposed to do is preach the gospel. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. Here he tells them in advance, don't even bother. They don't want to receive you. Get out of town. Oh, if I just go and do this, I'll get them. You know, if, I, if I look just like them, I'll get No, no, no. He said, he said get out of town. They're not going to receive you. Isn't that what he said? Well, I guess if, if the Holy Spirit told them that, then, you know. For they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am in prison and beaten every synagogue, them that believed on me. So that when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, I, or I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Now he argues with the Lord. He says, Lord, I mean, look, I mean, with my testimony, it's going to have a revival. See, a lot of things we think that God's calling us to do, we think is a good idea, and it's not the God idea. That's why we're to get into the Spirit. We're to get into the Holy Ghost and let Him lead and guide and direct us. There are times you're not supposed to go do certain things because you're casting your pearl before the swine. Amen. And He knows they won't receive it. That's right. As a matter of fact, it's going to give them another opportunity to kill Him. Thrill. I know that messes up a lot of new, new teaching in the church, but it's the truth. If anybody had a testimony that would fix it, Paul... He's going around having Christians fed the lions. He said, I was there when they stoned Stephen. I held their coats and I was consenting unto his death. And actually a spirit got on him in that. And he went out and, tried and started replicating that everywhere he could go. It's, it's, the drawing of Stephen's blood did something to him. That he wanted to multiply that and do that. He went out breathing out threatenings. And Saul brought, yet breathing out threatenings. 
See, it happened after he saw uh, Stephen stoned to death and held their coat. So that spirit, that, that religious devil got on him, and he went out trying to kill people. And then he goes, well, look, hey, they, they know I was there. He, they know I held the coat. They know I was killing Christians. They, man, if I tell them I, I got saved and you're Lord, they're going to believe it. That's what he's arguing here. The Lord said, get out of here. See, we don't teach these things in church because it, it doesn't sell good books. We don't get to sell our 15-point series on how to reach everybody in the world and nobody reject what you say. No, I'll tell you how we're supposed to evangelize. We'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. We'll be led by the Spirit. We'll say, full of God. And, when he, and, and as he leads and guides us and opens doors of opportunities, we minister. Amen. And we take those opportunities. Amen. <clears throat> and I'm going to read this other chapter of the verse. Hallelujah. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And when they gave him audience unto this word, they lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. No. Not just, just not take him away. Kill him. Away with such a fellow from the earth. That ain't talking about taking him to the next room. For it is, uh, it's not fit that he should live. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air, <clears throat> the chief cat the commanded him, to, boy, these people are crazy. It's dust in the, throw not dust in there. That's what it is, it's crazy. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade they should examine him, be he be examined by scourging, that he might know whereof they cried so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned. He pulled his trump card out. And the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me. I'm mean, sorry. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed that thou, what thou doest. This man's a Roman. Now, you just, for a, anyone to scourge a Roman, now they could scourge anybody else, but if it was a Roman, it, it could be put to death for it. The, the laws for the Roman citizens were really not, were, were nice for them. And um, the captain came to him and said, tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yep. Now King James says, yay. Yo! Dog, I'm a Roman. All right? And the chief answered, the chief captain said, with a great sum I obtained this freedom. In other words, I had to buy my citizenship. Paul said, I was born. I'm not, I, I didn't migrate to become a Roman. I was born a Roman. Then straightway he departed from him, which should have examined him. The guys who were getting ready to be, beat him took off. They didn't want their name written down. They didn't want any eyewitnesses that they were the ones about to scourge a Roman. Okay? And the chief captain also was afraid. See, now that means they were afraid. They bolted, baby, for, after he knew that he was a Roman because he had bound him. He, he could get in trouble just for binding him. Paul plays trump card at the right time. <laughs> Amen. So they, they, the guy's like, look, hey, we're sorry. You, want, you would you like to have uh, T-bone steak? You know, what, what can we do for you? Okay, what can we do to make you comfortable here? You know? And uh, on the morning, because he, he would have known the certainty wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his band, bands and commanded the chief priests and all the people, council to appear, and brought Paul down and set him before them. And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for thou sittest thou to judge me after the law, and uh, commands me to be smitten contrary to the law. And they stood by and said, Revilest thou of God's high priest? Then Paul said, I wist not, brethren, or didn't know that uh, he was the high priest, for this written, thou shalt not speak evil of the rule of thy people. But when Paul perceived that the one part was Sadducees and the other Pharisees, now how did he perceive the Holy Ghost say, hey, half these guys are Sadducees, and the other guys are Pharisees? He, had his, he knew what to do. Have you ever been in a place where all of a sudden you knew exactly what to do? And you're sitting there, where you, one minute you don't have a clue, and the next minute you know exactly what to do. Where do you think that came from? The Holy Ghost rose up. I said, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost rose up. 
and gave you exactly what to do in that moment. You knew exactly what to do. You weren't, you weren't like, oh, God, what am I going to do? No, you knew. Hallelujah. And um, so when, uh, uh, but when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees, the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee. And the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am called into question. Now he had them arguing themselves. All right then. And when he had said so, there rose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. He had them fighting among themselves. How often did God turn the, their enemies to fight among themselves? You give them long enough, they'll fight among themselves. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there rose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part rose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there rose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Now, they, they were going to try to, you know, come together and take care of Paul and, and whatever. And he found out, the, you know, and then they just got to fighting among themselves so bad they didn't know what to do. The Pharisees are going, hey, there's nothing wrong with this guy. He believes in the resurrection. He believes in the spirits. He believes in the angels. Said, he don't believe in any of it. They're all fighting. Yep. Going to be dumb. You're going to have to be tough. All right. Um, and the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for the, as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so thou must bear all, witness also it at Rome. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And there were more than 40 which made this conspiracy. That's one thing, just have one guy chase. You've got 40 people hiding, waiting, looking for the opportunity at any moment. You don't know who they are. And they're going to come out of the woodwork at some point in time and kill you if they get a chance. And they're not going to eat or drink until they do it. So if we're talking about a short period of time here that they're talking, working on. They're not going to go up for so much long. They're going to get hungry and they're going to say, we're going to have to kill him so I can eat. Hello? And, um, they were, uh, and, and they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now, therefore, with the council, uh, well, now therefore, ye with the council, signify to the chief priest that he bring him down unto you tomorrow, as though you would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come uh, near, we are ready to kill him. They're getting the chief priest in on this thing. And when Paul's sister's son, so somebody overheard, um, heard of their lying away, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, bring this young man to the chief captain for he have a certain thing to tell him. So he took him, brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto, you, called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who hath something to say to thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand, went by, with him aside privately and said, and asked him, what is it that thou hast to tell me? He said, the Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldst bring Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire something of him more perfectly. But do not yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than 40 men which have bound themselves with an oath. They will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him and now are ready looking for a promise for, from them. So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him, see thou tell no man that thou hast showed me these things. Now, you, when you're dealing with conspiracies, you can't let people know what's going on. You, you, if, you know, if you know about it, you can't let them in on, the, on it because you've got to work around everything. Okay? And he called them two saturns and said, make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea. Now see, they're down here in Jerusalem and they're going to run up to Caesarea there. Okay? Make 100, 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen, three score and ten, that's 70 horsemen, and spearmen, 200, at the third. Now, he's got 200 soldiers, 200 spearmen, and 70 um, cavalry. Horsemen, cavalry. Man, 280 men to protect Paul from these 40 guys. Provide them beasts, they may set Paul on and bring him in safe unto Felix the governor, and we wrote a letter after this matter. Claudius, now remember, the reason that one day, they don't know, if, if Paul gets killed as a Roman on his watch and Rome finds out, he's toast. Got it? He's absolute toast. So Claudius Lysias, 
unto the most excellent governor Felix sendeth greeting. This man was taken of the Jews and would have been killed of him of them. That uh, then came I with an army and res rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. Boy, he's dressing this story up. And when I would have known the cause whereof they accused him, I brought him forth into their council, whom I proceeded to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid at his charge worthy of death or bonds. And when it was told me that the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straight away to thee and gave commandment to the, his accusers also to say before thee that thou hast what they have against him um, to you, basically. Farewell. Then the soldiers that was commanded them took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. I think that's in there somewhere. Let me see here. Is that Antipatris in there somewhere? Yeah. It's, it's in, he got him out of Jerusalem and got him over here to Antipatris. On the morrow, they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle. And there was a, the 400 guys left off, but they still sent the horsemen. In other words, they wanted to make sure they got him out of the city safe. All right? And when they came to Caesarea, back up there to Caesarea, and delivered the epistle to the governor, or the letter to the governor, presenting Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of the providence he was. He said, and when he understood that he was a Sicilia, he said, uh, I will hear thee, he said he, when thine accusers are come, and he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. Now, uh, we're, next week we'll, we can, well, we can, let's take, let's take a few minutes to get to this next chapter. And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullius, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he had called forth, Tertullius began to accuse him, saying, See, seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and thou art very worthy, deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thy thankfulness. In other words, he's sucking up. <clears throat> we, um, notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldst hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this fellow a pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition among the Jews throughout the world, and the ringleader of a sect of the Nazarenes, who also have gone about to profane, profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us and we, with great violence took him away out of our hands. Boy, now he's telling the story on another side. Commanding our, his accusers to come unto thee by examining examining of whom thyself may, mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Then Paul, after the governor was beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because thou hast made thyself understand, and that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for the worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither rising, I'm sorry, raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city, neither can they prove the things that whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto you that the, after the way which they call heresy, so worship I God of my, the God of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law and the prophets, and have hoped toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there should be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and men. Now after many years, I, bring, I come to bring alms to my nation and offerings. Whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been before, before, uh, here before thee and object if they had all against me. Or else let these, say, these same here say if they found any evil doing in me while I was before the council. Except to be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called into question by you this day. And when Felix heard that these things had more, uh, having more perfect knowledge of the way, he deferred them, said, Why, uh, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your manner. Matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty that he should, not, he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or to come to him. And after certain days when Felix came down with his wife, um, Drusilla, aren't you glad we don't have these names today? How many, uh, Drusilla Hunt. How about Sapphire? Hammond's over there. Are y'all here? Or how about uh, Porcius Gill here? 
There's a name out here, Porcius. What's that, Jeff? Porcius? It looks like Porcius to me. <laughs> I mean, could, would y'all like some of these names? <laughs> okay. Which was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call. Now, see, the word began, to, the, the anointing began to get to him. But instead of yielding to that, he just ran him off. So go your way. I, I, when I got a more convenient time, I'll listen to you again. So I said, when I have a more convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should be given him of Paul, that he should loose him. Wherefore, he sent him for him to off center and commune with him. But after two years, Porcius Festus came into Felix's room. That means he took his place. And Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Now, this guy waiting for two years, hoping that Paul was going to pay him off to get, let him go. And so he would call for him and talk with him, hoping that Paul was going to pull out some money. Why? He was a freeborn Roman. So he, was, he, he probably was, and, and if he'd been freeborn, it means his family probably had some element of wealth. And so he's trying, he's trying his best to get some money out. Now, we're not going to get to the next chapter. Um, because when Festus gets here, with the, uh, was coming to the province after three days, he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem and the high priest. So you know what? For, as soon as they get a new guy in there, because the other guy, they figured out that, 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 um, that um, Felix wasn't going to do anything. So as soon as Festus gets there and takes over, and he goes down to Jerusalem, they, well, we got a new guy, we're going to hit him. It's kind of like that, brother, that story Brother Hagin tells about the woman. You know? Comes to see him after they got back from a, you know, got, got there, unpacked, preached the sermon, left for the, the annual convention for the denomination, got back into town, still unpacking on Tuesday after Sunday, and uh, this lady comes and start talking to him, starts talking, now, Brother Hagin, I know you're going to get to hear about this eventually. But he starts telling what this woman did in the church and all this kind of stuff, and he said, wait, 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 sister, when did this happen? She went, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, and, and he's thinking, now, that's about, that's about a week ago, and he thinks she's going to say seven days ago. She said, you know, what, what, you know, seven years ago this coming Saturday. <laughs> now, nah, don't get me wrong now. I forgive it all right. But I never will forget what that old devil did to me. And he called her a bare-faced liar. Anyway, but the point of the matter is, see, a new pastor came in town. She was going to get her story out there. And she probably didn't know any pastor had taken over that church. Anytime they showed up, she went and told them the story. Got her, got her whatever out there to get them on her side about something that happened years ago. Well, this is, what the Jew, this is what the chief priest did. As soon as Festus got there, three days after he got there, he went down to Jerusalem, and the chief priest, oh boy, we got him, got a new guy, we're going to tell him what Paul did. They've waited for two years. Here they go again. Why? They want to kill him. Man, these people just, they can't think about anything but killing Paul. You know, I, I, look, I, I know that, I understand apologetics in the body of Christ. I understand um, we have to be we have to be defenders of the truth with the truth. It is, I don't believe that the highest propensity is to name and call out people and pronounce judgment on them and they're going to die. And You know, there's one, there's one bozo out there that every time some Christian leader gets, something happens to him, it's the judgment of God. And he's just, I mean, he's just lamb blasting everybody. And if Copeland and all these other guys don't do, don't repent, they're going to have to meet the same fate. I mean, he just goes on and on and on and on. I think, why not? I just defriend him on Facebook. Well, they shut him down. <laughs> they shut him down, and then he opened it back up and asked, emails that everybody asked him to refriend him um, on Facebook. They shut him down because of, somebody complained. But, uh, you know, you can't just keep, you can't go after everybody with this, this zealot spirit. Now, it's, it, you could be a defender of the truth, but you defend truth with truth. You don't have to assassinate the character of an individual. Now, there are cases where somebody is an emissary of the devil, not misguided or mis, mis, whatever, that the Holy Ghost will have to lead someone to, that to be dealt with because it is, it's dangerous to the body of Christ. They are dangerous. Not just their teaching, they are dangerous. These guys had that zealot spirit to kill. All they could think about was killing Paul. They wouldn't even listen to what he had to say because they wanted to kill him. It's the wrong spirit. Now, there's things out there in the body of Christ I don't agree with. I don't believe there's teachers out there I don't agree with. Um, if you come to me in private and say, is so-and-so teaching that? I will tell you, yes, if, you, if, you're, if you've been watching and it's been bothering you and you're, it's not to assassinate their character, but you don't need to watch that because what they're teaching is wrong. 
is not to go after them. Sometimes we have to. Sometimes, um, you know, um, and we've done it like once in our ministry. We had somebody split our church, and they were just over in the other part of the city. I mean, they were eating us, eating our lunch. You know, he's the pastor of Jeremiah that's gathered all the sheep I've scattered abroad. But the Bible told, uh, told the Bible says, call, mark them which cause divisions. But he came in and he tore our church up. So I just stepped in service and said, look, this guy's doing this. He's going after people. And, of course, people got madder and went well off with this guy. And then a few years later, he got caught in adultery in his office with one of the people from the church that was in the church at the time. When, and then went to his church. Caught at 2 o'clock in the morning by the people who left our church. If they'd listened, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have gotten that mess. Now, we had people that, that had left our church that we had gotten off of drugs, gotten out of jail. Kept, one, one guy was on drugs and his wife was a mule. Now, I don't mean she looked like a mule. She, she was a trafficker. I went to the court, went to the judge in a court hearing and testified that she had gotten saved, that she was serving the Lord, and she wasn't doing those things anymore. And he, he gave her a suspended sentence. She did not go to jail. They got married, started serving in the church, working for the Lord, and then this mess happened, and got, this guy came in, got caught up. He's dead. He went back out, got back out on drugs. He's dead. Now, I'm not saying that in rejoicing. I, now, listen, the guy who calls all the problems is going to have to answer to God for that. The guy died because he went back out into the way of the world. He went back out into the things he came out of. They thinking just because they had a crowd that they were doing great because they had taken people out of here and we were just limping along because of what they had done, that we were wrong. We had, their lives were transformed and changed. Out of that bunch left, they ended up divorced. He died, had a heart attack. One of the other couples was divorced. One of the people, wanting, you can't keep them in church to serve God. They're in and out of church all the time. You know, can't, just can't get it right with God. Hello? I mean, you got to end up. The, uh, the, obviously, the woman was caught in adultery. Her and her husband divorced. And then took over her husband's, her, her, you know, her and her husband's property. They had a bunch of property with, they had, they, they well, anyway, I won't go into any detail, but they, they had a bunch of land. It was kind of a ranch type setup. The husband got kicked out. Because the woman took it. Because she was the wife. He sued for alienation of affection and won. And got all of it. They had to give up everything. They had to, they had to, so you're talking about a mess. That whole bunch is a mess. Well, in that case, the Lord had told me to tell the congregation, mark those who cause divisions among you. Have no fellowship with them. Withdraw yourself from them. And I told the church, stop hanging out with those people. And they wouldn't do it, and they kept, they kept listening, and they went off. And I'm telling you, 80% of them messed up. Do I rejoice? Absolutely not. It breaks your heart because you know those people had calls, those people had gifts, those people had purposes in the kingdom. Amen? And you wanted to help them get to where they were going, and you were helping them. You were in the process of helping them when the enemy came in. That's, that's not zealousy. That's not being a zealot. That's doing what you had to do to protect the flock. And they would listen. They wouldn't have been in the mess they're in. But to just go after people. Every time you see, every, I mean, every time I turn on Facebook, I get on Facebook, this, this guy's got out there, you know, about this one and that one and how they're false prophets and how this and how that and all this and then on and on and on. Said the other day, God did not talk to Katy Perry. I'm sorry. You know, Katy Perry said she prayed before she came out of the Super Bowl. Did I like her halftime show? No. There were the things in it that I would not, I would say were ungodly, yes. But did, would God speak to her? Absolutely. God will speak to you drunk in a bar. Why? Because he loves you and he wants to get to you. She said she was scared on that, that tiger. Now people come out and say that was the, the whore of Babylon on, on the beast. Like, the song is Eye of the Tiger. Or not Eye of the Tiger. The roar of a tiger. The roar of a tiger. It's, you know, it's, I, I got the, you know, the whatever tiger. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's really a pretty good song. I mean, you know, there's nothing whatever about it. But that's some, she did some stuff in the halftime show. I'm like, God knows why did you do that? You know? And I don't agree with it. And I don't, I don't I applaud it. And I don't lift it up. However, she asked God because she was afraid to go out there. And he said, I got you. He said, you got this and I got you. 
God would not speak to Katy Perry that way. Why in the world would you think that? He loves her. He doesn't want her to fall off that curse. And see, they probably hope she fall off this thing and say God judged her. Hello? I say hello. That, 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 the lesbian song, I kissed a girl and I liked it, should have never been on there. I don't agree with that stuff. I don't, I don't endorse it and I don't condone it and I don't magnify it. Yet at the same time, do I think God would have her back? Absolutely. Why? Because her parents are praying for her for one thing. Hello? They're holding up and praying for her for one thing. And y'all hear you gone home. So we, you know, so I didn't endorse it, but I'm not going to come out here and say, God didn't, there's no way God, if, if you believe God spoke to her, you're an illiterate Christian. No, I'm a very educated Christian. I know a lot about God, and I know a lot about the Holy Ghost. And I know God will speak to you in the, in the, in the, in the place that you, nobody else will speak to you. And yeah, maybe she was doing stuff she shouldn't have been doing, and maybe she was singing stuff she shouldn't have been singing, but I don't doubt for a second that when she called out to God, he answered her. Just so you know where I stand. Now, I did not get on Facebook and say, oh, it was wonderful. Katie was the most marvelous thing I've ever seen at a halftime show in my life. There were things that I couldn't condone. So I couldn't say that. But I'm not going to get on there and start lamb blasting her and telling everybody on the planet that she's of the devil and God didn't talk to her. I believe he did. You ever been in a place you didn't need to be and you called out to God and he answered you? Oh my, if God judged us like we judge other people, we've been gone a long time ago. I'm just telling you. And this kind of got off the cup about these zealots of Paul. They lived their whole lives trying to kill this guy. And they probably think when he finally got, got, he got killed, you know, and, and, you know, they got executed, that they were, whoa, we got it done. Paul did, and they couldn't kill him until Paul said, I'm in a difficult place. Whether the department of the Lord to stay here with you, you need me here, so I'm staying. Then later he writes, I've kept the faith, I've finished my course. Henceforth, there's laid it for me. And he was done. They couldn't kill him until he was done. How did he know? They stoned him, left him for dead, and he walked away from it. Now, you're talking about world-class stoners. Leaving him left for dead. They knew a dead stony when they knew one, saw one. <laughs> we ain't talking about being stoned. We're talking about being stoned. We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or Using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.